everyone I date is a mismatch. Why is everyone these days so needy and clingy? Is that so? Yes. It's too much for me. I need, I need more space now. I never thought about it's you attracting clingy people. Me? I didn't send any signals. Exactly. Welcome to today's episode. My name is Robert and today we talk about the big four attachment styles. You will understand what secure, avoidant, anxious and chaotic attachment patterns are. You will learn how they dictate your relationships as adults. And in the end, you will also discover which your own attachment style is. So let's start with the big question. If you never heard about attachment theory, what is that exactly? And what are attachment styles? Now, attachment theory is based on the assumption that we as human beings have an innate need to build close and intensely emotional relationships with other human beings. And from the beginning on, our experiences in relationships shape our bonding system for our whole life. How our bonding system is shaped in the early years will then dictate our future relationships as adults because emotions are always our ground for cognition. And Dr. Gabor Mate, he writes in his book, The Myth of Normal, about that phenomenon or about that experience. Now, he writes, early development sets the ground, whether strong or shaky, for all the learning, behavior and health or lack of it that will come later. The researchers' words, if taken to heart, would call our attention to much in our current culture that cries out for immediate renovation. Now, if emotion is the ground of cognition, then relationships are the tectonic plates that shape that ground. Of these, a child's early emotional interactions with their nurturing caregivers exert the primary influence on how the brain is programmed. Again, the unconscious comes first, followed later by things like intellect. So that underlines the fact that we know that our cognition is built on top of our emotional construct, which then means that how we behave later in our relationships is dictated by what we experienced early emotionally as children. Therefore, our attachment style as an adult developed exactly out of these first emotional bonding experiences with our caregiver, our parents, with people who were there for us. And if these experiences were characterized by traumatic things, by, by heavy negative, let's put it this way, emotions such as fear, ambivalence, things like manipulation, abuse or neglect with the attachment figure, then we may have developed trauma as children. So this is what we label here as CPTSD. Now, insecure attachment styles like the anxious, the avoidant or chaotic cognitive patterns we will talk about later, those develop out of these past traumatic experiences we as children made. And our attachment style dictates all of our relationships, starting with obviously romantic relationships because those are pretty close and intense, but also friendships, professional relationships in work contexts, family relationships with your siblings, with your parents, grandparents. But obviously, in romantic relationships, we see our patterns, our uh, attachment patterns most intensely because those relationships, as I said, are the most close ones where we feel the most attracted to the other person. 
Now, fundamentally, attachment style were researched first in the 50s and 60s by psychologists like John Bowlby, James Robertson, uh, Mary Ainsworth. Definitely worth to mention here that you know uh, who developed those things. And what they did in their research lab was they created a, a so-called test situation with really, really young children, okay? So what did they do to research attachment styles? They put a foreigner person and some toys for the child in a room, okay? You have this room, there's a foreigner person, there might be some chairs, there are some toys, maybe some plants, a test environment. Then the caregiver and the child comes in, enters the room, the child usually is between 11 to 18 months old, so younger than two years old. And that also means, by the way, if you haven't developed a secure attachment style before the age of two, because this is when they did those tests, then you might have serious problems later on in life. Okay. Now, what they did is, Caregiver came into the room with the young child and then the caregiver leaves the child alone in the room with the foreigner in the test environment with the toys, of course, and the plants and stuff, and then comes back a couple minutes later. And then they looked how the child interacted or didn't interact and how the child behaved when the caregiver left the child alone with the foreigner in the room. So what they saw is when they looked at the later development of that child, of that human being, is that the attachment styles and the patterns, the cognitive and emotional patterns that the child already showed before the age of two correlate strongly with the attachment styles that the child has as a grown-up person. Okay, that means your attachment patterns that you had before age two correlate with how you behave as an adult in your relationships. Isn't that great? I think that's amazing. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> so those are the four attachment styles. We have on the x-axis, fear of loss. So losing someone, getting left alone. And then we have on the y-axis fear of commitment, so fear of intimacy, being close to someone. Now, secure attachment is always low in fear of loss, low in fear of commitment. Okay, those people definitely have those fears, but not as strong. Then we have the avoidant attachment style. That's high in fear of commitment, low in fear of loss. And we have the anxious attachment style, high in fear of loss, low in fear of commitment. And we have the chaotic attachment style, high in fear of commitment, high in fear of loss. Now we talk about all of the attachment styles in detail. Let's start with the secure attachment. Now the secure type, we have around 58 to 60% of the population which are in that category. So most of us are fine. That's a great thing at first. Yes. Well, people of this type are usually described as emotionally open and stable. They are able to express emotions, able to communicate their needs. They really set healthy boundaries. And if you are this type, you can already close the video now because you are great. Perfect. I'm just joking. Maybe you get informed about the other types as well. So for someone who is secure attached, re-regulation and regulation usually happens through a close and secure connection and contact with a trusted relative, for example, your partner. I visualize it like this because this is one of the biggest re-regulators when you're young, okay? For a child, usually the child is dependent 
to regulate through the relative, through a caregiver. But it's not the only possibility to regulate because children also play with toys, they explore the environment and stuff, and that also regulates them. But the main regulator is uh, the connection with the other person here. Now, when you are secure attached, you're able to re-regulate and regulate yourself through a trusted connection with, for example, your partner. So that's great. The secure type usually combines the best characteristics out of the other types. So the secure type is really great in self-soothing on the one end and self-regulating and probably learned that early on as a child to also regulate themselves through, for example, playing with toys or exploring the environment and on the other hand is great in co-regulation that means secure people trust in the connection with other people and therefore are able to re-regulate themselves through other people through stable relationships this is what the insecure types are not capable of the secure attachment types core belief is i am okay you are okay. So both sides are perfectly fine. I'm fine. You are fine. They have a healthy sense of self. They see themselves in a healthy way. They perceive the world through their own eyes and not, for example, through a third person perspective. Still, secure people are most often those who think wrongly that they're insecurely attached people. Why is that? That is because usually when you are a secure person, you grow up in a safe environment with caregivers who are able to regulate themselves, your parents most of the times, then all of your needs are met. You feel emotionally and physically safe. And when you are in that relaxed state, when your nervous system is in that safe environment, then only then you have also the capacity to be critical about your caregivers and that means at the same time you feel safe around them but well everything is fine so you might spot problems in their attachment you might be able to criticize them because you think well yes you are great 99 percent of the time but you could do better 1% of the time and you know the weaknesses of your parents because everyone has flaws. So you are able to criticize them, but at the same time know that they won't freak out when you do so. Because when you do that with someone, with a parent who's not able to re-regulate themselves, what, what will happen then? you will get, for example, beaten up or the parent will scream at you because he or she is not able to regulate themselves. Someone who is securely attached usually feels comfortable when being single and when being in a relationship. Usually there are no intense fears and there is no neurotic energy for getting into a relationship or avoiding it for any chance. People who are insecurely attached do that. They have this neurotic energy. I have to be with someone or I don't ever want to be with someone. And what they also don't do is they don't lose their sense of self. What insecurely attached people do so because they're struggling with symptoms like dissociation of complex trauma. Now, how do people who are securely attached react when dating? That's really interesting. We do that for every type here. So when they meet an anxious person and they feel their neediness, they also will react with avoidance. Because what a securely attached person will think is, so you as an anxious, I somehow feel that you don't meet my worldview. I am okay, you're okay, but you don't really seem okay. So the person will avoid anxious people. Now, when a securely attached person will meet an avoidant person, 
and then feel their avoidance, then the securely attached person will also react with, with avoidance. Because you don't meet my worldview again, I'm okay, you're okay, but you try to make me think that I'm not okay. So the person who is securely attached will always look for someone who is also securely attached. That means they also look constantly for someone who have healthy, grounded and calm characteristics. But a securely attached person can definitely also feel anxious and avoidant as well, but not as extreme and not in situation where there is actually no reason to feel anxious or avoidant. Now let's talk about the avoidant attached person. The insecure avoidant type usually makes up around 18 to 20 percent of the population. People of this type are usually described as having a pseudo-independence. They have noticeable avoidance behaviors. If you're an avoidant person, then you might already know. Maybe you avoid relationships for any chance. And what's typical for people who are avoidant is that they have compensating stress strategies and they do that through hobbies, through work, sports, sex affairs, friends, drugs or other distractions. Now for avoidant people, regulation and re-regulation usually happens inefficiently through compensatory or so-called deactivating strategies like, as I said, hobbies, work, sports, affairs, and those kind of things. Now, they do that because regulation and re-regulation through a relative, through a caregiver, is really hard for them. So they look for other ways to regulate themselves. The main characteristic here is that they're not really good in co-regulation, as the secure attached person is. Now, why is that? Before age two, avoidant children learned to self-regulate and to only self-regulate most of the times. Reasons for that are that parents, for example, were unable to regulate themselves pretty well, maybe because the caregivers were ill, Maybe the caregivers were immature themselves and needed parenting themselves. Maybe a caregiver is not a reliable source for co-regulation and therefore people who are avoidant attachers, they didn't really learn to use co-regulation as a strategy to regulate. Well, their core belief therefore is, I'm okay, but you are not okay because this is what I experienced in my early years. So when the other person is not okay, I'm okay, then I think, please stay away. I'm best on my own. Therefore, what do they do? They create emotional, elusive independence. Avoidant people most of the time still mistype themselves as secure people. Why is that? Because they believe I'm so good on my own, I don't need anyone else to regulate myself, so I'm good. I'm not anxious, I'm not clingy, I'm not needy, I'm really good myself. And I also know that from myself, because I'm also more on the avoidance side here. What's typical for us avoidance is that we usually also repress and deny, okay? Because we don't like the fact that we maybe are not so able to regulate through our relationships, okay? Because we maybe don't really trust other people. So we as avoidance, we never really understood that we were neglected, maybe emotional in a way. But what we do instead is we believe that it's normal to not really get attention and love from others because this is how we learned it. And this program, those patterns lead us to unconsciously avoid intimacy in the end. 
Avoiding people believe that other people, when I date someone, for example, or when I, I'm with friends, for example, then I believe that those people want my time. You might believe that they want your energy, your resources, and therefore we often feel overwhelmed by those other people. We usually, as avoidance belief, as I thought, we have that core belief, I am best on my own. And we don't like the feeling that others have expectations of us. Now, avoidant people believe that they are resourceful and they believe that they're the best problem solvers for themselves and see others as needy machines that want their time and energy. I also made a full episode about the fear of commitment, which is the primary source of fear here, which I will link to you up here. So if you haven't watched that, definitely check it out. So what avoidant attachment style people do is they commit very slowly to a relationship. They have deactivation strategies to make them emotionally cold when they enter a relationship so they can move away from that relationship if they're too overwhelmed and if necessary. Those deactivation strategies I explained to you before, again, are, for example, hobbies, are sports, work, alcohol, other drugs, affairs, those kind of things. It's not, and that's important to understand for avoidant attachers, it is not that we don't like other people. And I said that in the fear of commitment episode before. It is just that we didn't learn that co-regulation and a trusted relationship is even an option. Okay, so we have never opted into that. We just don't know. Also, we don't ask other people for help because that never ever was an option as well for most people who are avoidant attachers. Great, let's continue with the anxious attachment. The insecure ambivalent type, which is another name for the anxious attachment, makes up around 18 to 20% of the population as well at the avoidance. And people of this type are usually described as contradictory attached or ambivalent to the relative. And we see that here now Re-regulation happens partly and inefficiently through the connection with the relative, for example, the partner, but the person doesn't really trust this connection enough. So there's not much self-soothing here. There is the only way to regulate through co-regulation. So they need the other person to stay regulated and to re-regulate and therefore they overdo it because obviously they're afraid to not being able to regulate. So this is what we see here through the arrows. Regulation partly happens through a not trusted connection. So they need the other person, but they still don't really trust them. So why is that? The anxious person learned early on that they have to over assert their needs to get them met. And reasons for that are various. For example, as a child, maybe the caregiver was unresponsive, was often dissociated themselves, was maybe ill, mentally ill, was maybe overwhelmed by work, by other siblings, because you might have many siblings and your parents had to split their focus and their energy between five children maybe. And therefore the anxious child learned that he or she has to scream, scream really loud and need many, many strategies to get the caregiver's attention. For example, what do those children do? They throw things around, they laugh pretty loud, they try to smile to get the attention. They, they scream, they cry, maybe they poop. Just found strategies to get the attention of the caregiver. And therefore, as an adult, anxious attached people have a backpack full of strategies 
to use to get the attention of their partner. Those strategies are called protest behaviors and strategies and basically would say it's some form of manipulation. What they basically say and want to say is, hey, I exist, give me attention, okay? Because they needed to do that as children. Those strategies can be, for example, in the beginning, being nice at first, then also showing needy behaviors, crying a lot, still as adults, please never leave me, those kind of things. Or they also might start a fight or they show themselves passively aggressive. Why do they do that? Fighting, discussing, those kinds of things are also strategies to create a lot of focused attention. You can discuss here if that's some form of manipulation in a way, but what they want is they want attention because they learn that they have to overassert their needs to get them met. Now, in the worst scenario, then they might even try to threaten the partner that they might leave them, okay? They say things like, I, I might leave you if you don't give me the attention, and they don't really mean that, but they try to get the attention of the partner this way. The core belief of an anxious attached person is that I'm not good enough, but you are, so please take care of me and fill this hole inside me, okay? This is what they think. And what they do this way, obviously, is they create a form of emotional dependence towards the other person. Anxious people also don't like to be alone. So what they do in dating is they look for new partners really quickly. They also rush through the infatuation phase and try to lock the other person as soon as possible. Why do they do that? If the other person is locked within the relationship, the contract is signed, there is as much commitment as possible, then this creates a sense of safety for the anxious person. Obviously, it's an illusion because, I mean, the other person still could left the relationship, but this way, this illusion creates safety towards the anxious person. And that's definitely the opposite of the avoidant person because the avoidant person is really careful, tries to enter the relationship as slow as possible, while the anxious attached person tries to enter the relationship as quick as possible. Now, for which partners are anxious attached people usually looking for? They usually hunt for people who figured it all out, okay? So those are people who will take care of them because those people are usually self-sufficient and those people are usually independent. And anxious people therefore often date avoidant people and the other way around because those two are such a great match. Now, last but not least, let's talk about the chaotic attachment. This attachment style is also called the disorganized type and it's also known as the fearful avoidant. And usually many people think that they're more of the disorganized type here, but usually this type is only 2% of the whole population. People of this type are usually described as showing behaviors like freezing, chaotic and destructive relationship dynamics, as well as a complete lack of emotions. Alexithymia is also possible here. Now, the chaotic attachment usually looks like this. What we see here is that regulation and re-regulation don't really happen at all. And that is because the person is dependent on the threatening, often toxic partner person, which at the same time is also the source of intimacy. So there is no re-regulation and regulation really happening, but instead ambivalence between destruction and intimacy. How is this chaotic attachment style compared to the others. Well, while the secure attachment covers all the positive traits of the anxious and avoidant attachment style, the chaotic attachment style covers all the negative traits from the anxious and avoidant.
Usually people who are in this part of the population, they have a negative self-view and a negative view of others. So their core belief is, I'm not okay, you are not okay. They believe I have to trick and manipulate other people into a relationship and I need to work hard to get their attention while at the same time they believe others are not trustworthy and they don't know how to co-regulate around others and that the world is also a dangerous place. So for them, relationships appear as a giant field of triggers. They haven't learned any strategies to get their needs met in the end compared to the insecure types. For example, avoidant types, they know that they can meet their needs on their own. They know that they can self-sue, that they have their strategies. Anxious people know that they can meet their needs through others if they just cry loud enough. And both have obviously not healthy strategies, but the thing is that they have consistent ones. So the anxious and the avoidant type themselves have strategies to rely on to get their needs met. For the chaotic types, it's the other way around. So for them, they have learned sometimes their needs are getting met, sometimes not. Sometimes they can rely on others and or themselves, sometimes not. So their relationships are more equal to a casino or to the lottery which is obviously horrible because you never ever have something to rely on in your relationships. Now for disorganized people, strategies are missing. That means they don't know when to move close and when to distance from someone. They don't know when to co-regulate and when it's necessary to set boundaries. Now they might have deactivating and activating strategies. So they have protesting and withdrawing strategies from the avoidant and the anxious type. Usually they have no clear goal in mind. So they don't know if they want more closeness right now or if they want more independence right now. That brings them to a really, really confusing relationship life. It's not just confusing for themselves, but it's obviously also confusing for their partners in the end. So how are disorganized types behave within dating? What they usually do is they rush into a relationship and as the relationship becomes more serious, they quit it and then run away. It's like a push and pull dynamic. They're usually 100% in or 100% out, but for them, it's really difficult to find a gray tone. And the biggest thing is that they do it usually in situations where it's absolutely inappropriate. So the chaotic feels avoidant or anxious when everything is going well. So when another person is opening up, for example, let's say they're dating another person and the person is, hey, you are great, I'd like to spend more time with you, then they quit the relationship. And if the other person, for example, shows avoidance signals themselves or shows mixed signals, then they become needy and clingy because this is their normality. This is how they learned it. Now, what they usually do is when a disorganized or a chaotic person enters a relationship, they usually enter it with an exit strategy. So they never enter a relationship without an exit strategy. So they know that, for example, when they're six months in the relationship, they can leave it again. Now, we talked about all of these attachment styles now. The question is, what can you do if you now think that you categorize yourself in one of these? First of all, I recommend to you doing the quiz, the attachment style quiz. There is a free attachment style test, which I will link to you below today's episode, or you just go to quiz.attachmentproject.com and there you can do the quiz and the test asks you 
many questions about the relationship with your mother, with your father, with your partner, and therefore you can identify your attachment style. It's really funny and also helps a lot to find the red line here. So definitely do it. Then there is also this open question why you can't just stay avoidant or anxious and look for a secure partner. Well, there are various reasons for that. Now, there is an obvious reason, and that is secure types rarely date insecure types. And why is that? First of all, insecure types, such as the anxious or avoidant, are usually both constantly on the market because they are so insecure. So they don't really find a good match. This is why they stay on the market. Second, they are also aligning so well to their unconscious needs and patterns. And this is seen from an anti-receptive relationship dynamic perspective because the avoidant type exactly attract the needs of the anxious type and the other way around. Third, insecure people usually feel not attracted or not really in love with secure people. Maybe you have experienced that before in your life. You meet someone and you think, well, this person, ah, this might be a really good match. I really like this person somehow, or I feel like I could be friends with this person and this person gives me a calm energy. But there is, there is not this spark. There is not this, I don't feel that attracted to that person. Okay, this is usually what we see here when we have an avoidant or an anxious person dating a secure attached person. Well, avoidance constantly wait the secure person to demand from them. And the anxious person usually constantly waits until the secure person pulls back from them because this is what they learned. This is what they're used to. So those dynamics again become self-fulfilling prophecies because of these unconscious behaviors going on. And fourth, of course, the secure person is also not attracted to them, but the secure person instead is looking for people with a grounded, regulated and rational approach to relationships. That is the opposite of the neurotic energy of the anxious and avoidant attachment styles. So the only solution here is to become a secure type yourself. What can you do to become a secure type? First of all, be hopeful. That's always necessary because it is absolutely possible to rearrange every single of those attachment patterns. Anxious people can learn to trust and rely on themselves more. Avoidant people can learn to trust others more and to co-regulate. Disorganized people can learn to self soothe and rely on themselves and at the same time trust and rely on other people. Secure people are probably not watching anymore. If you do so, you might now know a lot more about, for example, your partner or other people. And secondly, the big second solution, understand that the insecure attachment patterns are a result of childhood trauma. That's a really big realization here, which is helpful to identify your red line in resolving those uh, patterns. And this is definitely what this channel and what our community is mainly about, right? So if you want to resolve the symptoms of early trauma now, you can use the resources here on this channel, for example. We also have a free workbook. If you download that, it gives you all the advice needed to start re-regulating better. It has all the re-regulation strategies in it that I personally, for example, collected in my years of therapy. There are also writing techniques in it. You can download it on the website, a link, a first link in the description. And if you watch this video later after release on the same website, then you can now join our exclusive school community, which I'm building at the moment. And in this school community, you can get, first of all, individual support of our members and also of me. 
I'm sharing my attachment style challenges and you also have access to all of our online courses on how to communicate your emotions better, how to communicate your needs, how to set healthy boundaries, how you deal with your attachment style, how you develop a secure attachment style and how you finally therefore develop secure attachment patterns that make it possible for you to have safe and loving relationships. Now, have you done the test already? If you do that test now, definitely leave me a comment. What was your test result? Which attachment style is suiting you the best? Also, if you want to support the podcast, definitely leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And I see and speak to you in the next episode. Have a great day.